Welcome, everyone. I am Nick Lund, the Advocacy and Outreach Manager for Maine Audubon. I will be your host today, along with Melanie Sturm, the Forest and Wildlife Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Hello, Melanie. Hi. And today we are taking an inside look at Maine's threatened and endangered species. In addition to honoring the birthday of Rachel Carson, a biologist, nature writer, and celebrated conservationist who has deep connections to our beautiful state, we will learn about some of Maine's fascinating, threatened, and endangered species. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. In just a moment, you'll hear special remarks from Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, U.S. Representative for Maine's first congressional district. We are also joined today by Steve Walker, Rare, Threatened, and Endangered Species Coordinator for the Maine Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife. Steve, thanks so much for joining us to talk about a couple of Maine species, including Rusty Patch Bumblebee, Canada Lynx, and Bald Eagle. And after that, we'll turn it over to Nick to talk about Piping Clover. So before we get started, just some technical things. We're, we all know Zoom, it's been years now, right? But just in case, uh, we are in the webinar format, which means that we can't see or hear you. So if you do have questions at any time during the program, please type them into the Q&A box, which you see, it's the two little speech bubbles um, down below. Type them in there. Uh, we will have an open question period at the end of the program. So we'll be saving them all towards the end. Um, we are recording this and it will be up on probably both of NRCM's and Maine Audubon's websites uh, following this. So if you miss anything, uh, don't worry about it. And uh, we look forward to your questions uh, at the end. So without further ado, uh, to honor the birthday of one of the nation's environmental heroes, Rachel Carson, who would have been 114 years old today, we have a video from Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. And I want to say, make sure you turn up your volume and let's go. Todd, do you want to share that video? Yep, uh, it's just taking me one second here. Sorry yeah, okay. about that. Welcome. And thank you for tuning into today's program with the Natural Resources Council of Maine and Maine Audubon to celebrate Rachel Carson's birthday. Rachel Carson was an admired conservationist who sparked an environmental movement and motivated the nation to protect at-risk species. Her legacy is proof that individuals can make a difference when they put their passions into action. Rachel Carson's connection to Maine runs deep. The natural beauty of our state inspired her writings, which influenced so many. We have honored her contributions in so many ways here in Maine, including the Rachel Carson Wildlife Refuge in Wells. I had the honor of touring the refuge in 2019 as we advocated to permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. 40 years ago, bald eagles in Maine had declined to only 30 nesting pairs. But Rachel Carson's pivotal book, Silent Spring, inspired a recovery effort. There are now hundreds of nesting pairs, and a soaring <laughs> eagle has become a frequent sight along our waters. As a result, bald eagles are no longer an endangered species. The bald eagle is one of the many success stories from the Endangered Species Act, our nation's best tool for protecting wildlife. Unfortunately, we know that while the bald eagle has rebounded, millions of other species are at risk. In 2019, UN scientists warned that more than 1 million species are at threat of extinction, some within decades. In Maine, threatened plants and animals like the Atlantic salmon, Canada lynx, piping plover, and others are endangered and at risk of extinction. Climate change, habitat destruction, pollution, and invasive species are all impacting the planet's ability to support a rich diversity of species. A biodiversity crisis threatens the health of humans and our planet, impacting the ability to produce clean air and clean water. I hope this webinar will inform you about the importance of biodiversity in keeping our planet healthy. Take that with you as you remember Rachel Carson's legacy and how her passion for the natural world 
made a difference for future generations. Thank you. Though she passed away on April 14, 1964 from struggles with and treatment for cancer, Rachel Carson's legacy lives on vibrantly. Most of you know, in fact, it may be the reason that you're here, that Rachel Carson led a scientific investigation and expose of the effects of DDT, a toxic synthetic pesticide on bird populations, which is detailed in her renowned book, Silent Spring, published in 1962. It remains to be a central reading for all environmentalists. Because of her pioneering work, we live in a world that is healthier for people and the environment. Rachel Carson used to summer in Maine. She moved here for a job with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and in the 1950s founded the Maine chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Today, there is the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge in Wells, which if you haven't been to, you should, is absolutely beautiful. And the Nature Conservancy's Rachel Carson Salt Pond Preserve in Bristol, which I've not been to, but I will hopefully go right after this, uh, which recognizes her achievements and her significance here in Maine. Uh, Rachel Carson's scientific discoveries helped pave the way for landmark federal legislation like the Endangered Species Act, or ESA. Because she was a champion for species protection, Steve Walker is here to tell you about several main threatened and endangered species that are currently listed under the ESA. Thank you, Steve, and take it away. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Melanie. Now let me share my screen and get, oh, I got the wrong one there. Uh, hold on. Technical difficulties abound. Um, okay. Can you see that, Nick and Melanie and everybody else? Excellent. So I wanted to start off with uh, just a snapshot of Endangered Species Acts in general. There are two. The federal ESA, which passed in 1973, and our very own Maine Endangered Species Act, passed in 1975, which was modeled on the federal act. Um, a couple differences between the two. The federal list currently has 22 species in the state of Maine. Um, Maine has two endangered species lists, if you will. One that falls under uh, the authority of Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, who I work for. That list currently has 52 species on it. Um, with this pie chart, you can sort of see a breakdown. It's largely insects and birds. The marine species, including whales, um, sturgeon and sea turtles falls under the jurisdiction of the main uh, Department of Marine Resources that has nine species. So overall, we have a little over 60 species in the state listed as endangered and threatened. And above and beyond that, we have uh, close to 100, if not more, species of special concern, which our department biologists track. Uh, and monitor. We're now revising that list, updating it, and I think through a mandate in 2022, we are going to start revising the Maine Endangered Species Act list um, to follow suit. We also, through our what's called a wildlife action plan, which if you're not familiar, you can find on our department's webpage, the state wildlife action plan, where we have over 300 species of greatest conservation need. Those are ones that we know the populations are fluctuating. We may not have all the answers, but we know enough to keep an eye on them and monitor those for the potential of future listing. Hopefully we don't need to go there. Um, the poster on the left side of the screen, you can buy that at our department website and proceeds go to help fund the Endangered Species Program. Speaking of funding, um, non-game and endangered species work in this state relies heavily on voluntary donations. Um, as Congresswoman Pingree pointed out, uh, we do get federal funds and she and other members of the delegation have been champions of the sport fish, wildlife and sport fish restoration program, which gets us grant dollars to do the work our department does with non-game species. And of course, these other mechanisms you see before you, everything from chickadee checkoff to outdoor heritage fund stickers to license plates. And my favorite, the birder band down in the corner, 
all help fund various parts of our work. So we encourage everyone on the webinar to get involved and join us. But let's first start talking about uh, a species was been uh, referred to several times already today, the majestic bald eagle, certainly a success story here in the state of Maine. Um, a very majestic bird is always a treat to see them fly by and it's great that uh, I can even see them down on downtown Brunswick over the college and on Pleasant Street now. Uh, a big bird lives up to 28 years, 30 years, um, is very uh, true to his nesting location as it's mostly an aquatic feeder eating fish, waterfowl, um, sea ducks. Typically nest high in the top of a, a white pine, which we have many along the coast. On some offshore islands, it will go to uh, spruce trees. The nests, because they're used for generations, get huge. Some of them we've found, uh, as it says here, seven feet across, 20 feet deep. A couple eggs are laid uh, early spring. Then these little guys appear, teeny little two and a half ounce uh, chicks that soon become uh, voracious <laughs> as they hit uh, a few weeks to a few months old. And you can see from this bird, the uh, direct line to dinosaurs by the looks of that thing. Um, they grow to about half size in around six weeks, uh, reach full size uh, nine to 10 weeks, but are still not uh, able to fly. Fledging usually occurs uh, after um, a Fledging usually occurs about three months. Um, and you can see there in that last slide, the plumage looks a lot different than the adults. So get into the history what uh, of the bald eagle recovery and what the problem was, as we've all probably heard, and certainly Rachel Carson brought to our attention, um, the prevalence of aerial insecticide spraying after World War II. Um, you can see up in the upper left here, a typical uh, flight over Northern Maine uh, back in the 50s and 60s. It wasn't out of the question that we'd be spraying these chemicals broadly. Uh, byproducts certainly affected um, nest success, keeping eggshells thin uh, and affecting the adult birds as well. So IFNW began intensive monitoring once we started to see the trends back in the early 60s when I think Congresswoman Pingree referenced, we only had 31 breeding pair in the state. Um, for decades, we did contaminant research, um, started intensive habitat protection in 1972, where we reached out to every landowner that had a nest on their property, worked directly with them cooperatively. Um, and ultimately by 1990s, we had designated a regulatory a tool called essential habitat that was applied around nests. Um, it also is currently in place for pipe and plover, which Nick will talk, talk about later. Um, and those efforts, hands on, uh, a lot of biologist hours, a lot of aerial survey flights, mapping nests, no, uh, documenting nests, is what really led to the situation improving. Um, by the mid 70s, the eagles were listed uh, nationwide, uh, mostly endangered in 43 states, threatening five others. Maine at that time in the late 70s was the stronghold in the, in the lower 48. So you can see here the concentration, even though it was only 62 pair, they're pretty well concentrated in down east Maine um, and working with those landowners got us to where we got to in our last aerial survey that we did in 2018 with 727 pair, and you can see mostly along the coast, up the major river valleys. Uh, this had led to us being able to delist them federally, delist them from uh, the state ESA, and now we've transferred our program instead of this individual nest site care, if you will, to a broader approach to land conservation, working with local land trusts, um, up and down the coast and in eagle nesting areas to start protecting habitat long-term, but no longer do we have to do the, as much hands-on work for individual pairs. So a great success story. Um, here's a look at the uh, over time from 1962 to 2018 and some of the key dates, um, passage of the Endangered Species Act back in 75, 
things start improving after uh, we did essential habitat in the 90s and you can see it just sort of takes off from there. Uh, but this is an example of a species where its habitat wasn't in decline. Certainly there are plenty of pine trees to nest in. It was just taking care of individual pairs, working with landowners um, and getting the job done, especially once we lowered the contamination levels. Moving to another example, Canada lynx, similar situation, a lot of habitat. So what's going on with these guys? Um, lynx, if you're not familiar with them, are a small cat about the size of a bobcat. They're adapted for snow. They've got these really long legs, uh, long tufts on their ear, um, fairly large home ranges of 18 square miles. And as their name suggests, Canada lynx, they're primarily in Canada. Uh, this pinkish wash that you see on Canada and Alaska is the core of their range, and they do drip across the border in northern Maine, uh, northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and then down uh, the mountain states in the west. But we are basically the stronghold in the lower 48 here in Maine. Um, another look at their adaptations, look at that paw in, in one of our biologist's hands. And then look at the uh, shot next to it where you can see the hand imprint in the snow. These things are just built for traveling in snow. Um, that's because their preferred prey is the snowshoe hare. Uh, they cycle with snowshoe hare populations on about a 10 year cycle. Um, and they're specialists on this. I think about 75% of their diet is snowshoe hare. They also eat grouse, um, squirrels, if they get them, um, and other small prey items. Their preferred habitat is this dense boreal cover, spruce fir cover, uh, like you can see in these slides. Um, they will go into mature woods if there are openings that have this sort of secondary growth coming in, but they really like it thick because that's where, of course, the snowshoe hares are. They den under uh, dense woody debris and blowdowns in some of these formerly clear cut or early successional sites. They have about one to five kits. Um, there's a full litter right there. Very cute little guys. Um, population trends uh, back in the 90s, we had about 250 to 300. Uh, today, more than a thousand pairs. That's the most in the lower 48. And that jump has been due to a couple factors. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, we had a spruce, bur uh, a spruce budworm outbreak, which is a parasite on uh, spruce buds that will actually denude the trees. There's an outbreak happening now in Atlantic Canada and is making its way into parts of Maine. It's cyclical. And after that uh, outbreak in the 80s, there was a lot of salvage cutting, a lot of die off, of course, because of the budworm itself. And that created a lot of early successional spruce fir growth where it was mature stands. So the habitat went up substantially. Um, our department has had a long history with this species. Uh, for decades, our warden service has been out there monitoring populations um, and surveying for it. We actually, Maine actually had a bounty on lynx back in the 60s that was repealed. And then the trapping season was uh, closed subsequent to that. We listed lynx as a species of special concern in the late 90s. It never made it to our uh, state endangered species list, primarily because of the population size and habitat availability. We felt that it was a species that could be managed for and not necessarily uh, not necessary for state a formal state listing. Um, the feds, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, did list it as uh, threatened in the year 2000, largely because of the lack of forest management for appropriate habitat types in the western lands. Um, while Maine's population was steady and increasing, uh, the Western populations were really taking a hit. And that was the impetus behind the federal listing. Um, so since the 2000 listing, we've invested a lot of time with our partners at US Fish and Wildlife Survey, Survey, Service to do uh, telemetry tracking. We've radio collared 85 individuals and track them for years to see productivity, health, 
Uh, we do snow track surveys. Uh, also, we're constantly trying to avoid incidental take. That's when uh, lynx gets killed um, accidentally, whether it be uh, through a trap setup or some other way. Uh, we have changed trapping regulations, of course, to try to uh, minimize this. Road mortality has certainly gone up since the population increased, so we uh, continue to monitor that. And then any credible sightings we keep track of. Habitat conditions, um, and we're in an enviable situation here in Maine because so much of our northern forest land is privately on working forests. And through certification programs and other incentives, these large landowners have been more than willing to work with us uh, to try to get um, links delisted. So it's no longer an issue on their lands and it can be compatible with their management goals. Um, you can see um, these numbers going up fairly dramatically from only a half a million suitable acres in the 80s, just before that budworm outbreak to a lot today, 1.4 million. And uh, the population estimate went up um, sort of linearly with the availability of habitat through management. Um, these guys, as I said before, they focus on that dense spruce fir cover. So forest management is you know, clear cutting blocks. It's doing pre-commercial thinning to maintain the density. It's uh, you know pretty oh, dogs are barking. Sorry, um, it's pretty pretty common approaches to northern Maine uh, land use or forest management, which has been great for for the critters. Um, hold on, I got it. I don't think she's gonna stop. Anyway, here's here's a, a map. We gotta go back here. Um, how do I go back? Sorry, guys. Bear with me. No worries, Steve. I'm just glad you didn't play the sound that a lynx makes because it's pretty terrible. Yeah, they can be. One dog well, getting bark. resituated. Just want to remind folks to put questions in the chat. We got a couple of good questions, or put them in the uh, Q and A. Rather, we got some good questions in there now, and we will get to them in uh, in a little bit. Okay, so um, here's the map I was trying to show before, but you can see the habitat expanding from 2006 to 2016, and those red dots are sightings of. Uh, the recorded observations of lynx, and you can see they've spread all the way down to down into down eastern Maine and gotten a lot more abundant in uh, the northern tier of our state. Just so you know, Steve, I think we're looking at the uh, B map right now. At the which map? I'm sorry. At, a, at the Rusty Patch map. Oh, all right. Hold on. That was it. Oh. All right. Well, let's jump to Rusty Patch <laughs> Bumblebee then. Hey. Um, so yeah, Lynx was another success story. And I, I meant to wrap up with that one, that it's in the process of being delisted federally now. Uh, the, the science uh, review has been completed. We're just waiting uh, for the formal um, recovery plan review and adoption by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that species will no longer be on the federally endangered species list. Um, so those are two species where habitat uh, could be manipulated or where nest site and um, contaminant tracking could be successful. This is uh, sort of the new challenges we're faced as wildlife biologists with rare species. The rusty patch bumblebee um, recently listed by the by the federal government in 2017. It's a pollinator. I'm sure you've all heard uh, what pollinators are going through. They're taking it on many fronts, not just habitat loss, but pesticides, um, invasive uh, parasites, uh, you name it. There's a lot of factors and it it's, makes management um, that much trickier. 
they were historically, Rusty Patch were historically in Maine. Um, Brunswick, my hometown, used to have them. They used to be down in New York County. Uh, now there's has only been two sightings since the year 2000 in the Midcoast area. We haven't seen any of these guys since 2009. Um, we are currently doing survey efforts. We'll be back out to uh, known historic sites this summer, hoping to see if there's any remnant populations in Maine. Um, and again, suspected uh, causes the decline, there's, there's many of them. So it's not just one factor we can take out of the equation and hope for a successful recovery like some of the other species. And we're seeing more and more of this with bats, with other invertebrates, you name it. Um, so we, we're still hopeful we can get more species. I think peregrines, Python plovers, with Nick is about to talk about, are recovering greatly. But these uh, inverts and other species are going to get uh, a little trickier as time goes on, especially in the climate change realm. So I'll hand it over to you, Nick. Let me stop sharing here. Perfect. And I will share right here. Let me try that one more time. All right, can you see that all right? Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was fantastic. Uh, and now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the piping plover. Oh, whoops, my bad. I meant to show you a piping plover, but I just, I guess I just put a picture of an empty rocky beach on here. Whoops, that's so embarrassing. Uh, let me try again. Here is the piping plover. Oh, man. Nope, again, I really screwed up. I just put some pictures of empty sandy beaches instead of any birds. Oh, no, nope. that was no good. Man, this is this is really embarrassing. All these pictures I put in here of the piping plover and it's just, just nothing but sand and beach. This is really weird. Uh, again, just nothing on here. Oh, it was a joke. This is what the kids call the humor, folks. Uh, this is the piping plover. Piping plover is uh, one of the most camouflaged uh, species in Maine. That's probably a, a wild overstatement, but their camouflage is incredible. Um, and each of these pictures, believe it or not, um, had a piping plover in it. So again, here the, here's the bird sitting in a little uh, footprint is what that is, looking away from us. There it's turned its head and you can see also the big uh, red circle helps. Uh, back on the first picture, there's a piping plover way over in the rocks over there. There's one sitting on a nest there, uh, camouflaged. That was the bird among the dunes. There it is in the sand. And there we go. Okay, good. Phew. I knew I had an actual picture in there somewhere. Uh, welcome everybody into to the, the piping plover. This is a uh, beautiful little bird, smaller than a robin, uh, sandy colored on the back, um, some black on the forehead, a black ring around the, the neck there. Um, uh, the, in the breeding plumage, which we have here up in Maine, they have this uh, black around their neck and on their forehead in the, uh, when they winter down, well, we'll talk about in a little bit, they lose the black and they're just sort of sand colored. Um, and like I said, they are masters of camouflage. Why? Why do they do that? It's because they spend their whole lives, uh, including laying their eggs, right out in the open on sandy beaches. Um, that is a strategy that they like. They like to nest right close to uh, the places that they eat. They eat out among the sand flats and the mud flats of beaches, picking little invertebrates out of the sand. Um, and they said, hey, let's just hang out here. We'll nest right here. Um, that's a great place to be. They're close to their food. But you know, nesting out in the open is pretty dangerous, right? Uh, you're exposed. Uh, you could be seen by a peregrine falcon or uh, a fox or anyone else on the beach. And so over the years, uh, piping plovers have evolved to blend in perfectly with their surroundings. And I'll say, having been on many sandy beaches in Maine, going out with the crews trying to monitor uh, piping plovers, they are extremely hard to see on the beach. Um, we we'll get to that in a second. I want to talk about a little bit about their populations. So there are uh, piping plovers breed along uh, sandy beaches, ocean shores in the northeast, and then along lake shores and alkali wetlands in the Great Plains and Great Lakes. Um, the total population, the world's population of piping plovers right now is estimated to be about 6,500 birds. That's about uh, half on the East Coast population and about half in the inland and Great Lakes populations. 
and to, just to sort of put that number in your mind a little bit, I, I did a little research. That is, um, that is less than the total population of Elliott, Maine. Uh, so I haven't even met anyone from Elliott before. There's not a ton of people. There are fewer. There are more than 6,500 people in Elliott. There are fewer that piping plovers in the world than people in Elliott. Um, you can see here from this um, this uh, range map here, they the blue areas are where they spend their summers, where they come up to breed, and the red or orange areas are where they spend their winters. So they fly. It gets too cold here in Maine. They fly back down uh, to beaches along the Gulf Coast, the Southern Atlantic Coast, and then um, uh, Cuba and some other spots down there. All right. Um, piping plovers, they come back to Maine early in the year. They are surprisingly early shorebird migrants. Um, we've seen them on the beach among the snow and ice in March. Um, they get up here, they try to pick their territories. Um, they like to nest uh, sort of above the high water mark in soft sandy areas. Um, and you can see behind this bird, see those little, the little sort of burnt dried seaweed? Um, their camouflage is designed to look exactly like that seaweed. So they'll nest among that and they really blend in perfectly. Um, so uh, they lay three to four eggs a year. Uh, they sit on the eggs for a few weeks and the eggs generally hatch in early June. So uh, I know the folks watching the beaches here in Maine are expecting some plovers to be back, um, uh, some little, little ones to be running around in just a couple of weeks. Let me show you what this looks like a little bit. I'm going to play this video. You can see here, there is a piping plover on, on its nest. Yep, it's scooting its little butt. So here it comes. And here comes, I believe this is the mom. So I think that's the dad standing up and the mom, the slightly drabber mom coming in. You can see that the there's a lot of care given to these eggs. Uh, the parent is sort of fanning itself out to protect the eggs a little bit while uh, the, the, the mother is getting situated. Um, Although in warm weather, like it appears today, you can see them sort of panting a little bit. Um, eggs can be left exposed for a, for a little bit while birds go and forage. You can see the mom just took off there. I, I don't know if the, the dad sort of knew that was happening. Um, so uh, this is what they look like. And you see they love to put their nest right there among the dried seaweed uh, where they really are completely camouflaged. Um, it's very easy um, uh, to almost step on them. The camouflage is their main sort of defense. And so they don't uh, fly away and make a lot of other noise. Like some birds, they will stay and freeze in place um, and uh, use their camouflage. So there he is picking away. So what's all the fuss about? It's about these guys here. Look at these cute little munchkins. Um, birds, uh, baby piping plovers hatch, like I said, in early June, and they are ready to roll. Um, they are running around and feeding uh, within a few hours. Um, their mass doubles in two days, right? They are just ready to roll and quadruples by the seventh day. Um, they can generally fly within a month uh, because, um, like I said, they need they are out there in the open and, and need to be able to uh, run away on those fast legs and then fly away if need be when the time comes. Um, you know, it's a dangerous spot out on the beaches and the nests are um, subject to predation from cats and dogs and foxes and gulls and crows and skunks, etc. cetera. And um, that's why uh, Maine Audubon and DIF and W and Fish and Wildlife and many others have come together to work to protect these birds. So nesting on the beach is uh, great. Who doesn't like hanging, on the, hanging out on the beach all day uh, and worked for piping plovers for many, many years. But when humans came along, things got a little more complicated, right? Um, humans also love the beach. Uh, we love to develop there and we love to hang out there and walk around. And so um, activity and development along beaches really impacted plovers, um, their, their populations. Um, the populations that if you throw back to that map I mentioned a minute ago, the piping plovers that nest around the Great Lakes are endangered. And then the birds that nest in the interior, uh, sort of mid Midwest, and then on the Atlantic coast are listed under the threatened, uh, are threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, but thankfully, there are folks out there to protect them. So um, this crew here is part of the piping plover and least tern. Uh, least terns are another threatened seabird that likes to nest on beaches in Maine. Piping plover and least tern recovery project. It is a cooperative effort. Um, Maine Audubon working in partnership with uh, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, Steve's group, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Maine Bureau of Parks and Land, lots of local municipalities who, who sort of operate these sandy beaches, 
and then lots and lots of volunteers who are out there um, taking care of these birds. Um, a lot of the work is done by um, uh, folks on the ground looking for nests in the spring, identifying the nests, and then very quickly building these little structures around the nest to protect them from predators and protect them from people blundering into them. Um, like I said, uh, the plovers can leave the eggs just for a minute. Um, and so these, this team is adept at swooping in, building the little um, structure, covering it with a uh, blueberry netting, and then getting out of there. The birds can walk in and out of the, of the cages, no problem, but uh, it makes it much more difficult for predators to get in. So that's what the crew does. We work, the, this amazing crew goes up and down all of Maine sandy beaches from Popham to York County, um, identifying uh, piping plover nests, protecting them, and then working with the, the towns and other people on the beach to um, encourage them to leash their dogs and to stay out of protected areas. So if you here are on one of Maine's sandy beaches right now or through the summer and see one of these signs or see some um, twine asking you to stay out of an area or some of those circular uh, fences, please stay out. Uh, take a look in, check out these cool little birds, but um, please make sure you stay out because um, there's a lot of good work being done. Um, is it working? The drum roll, please. Here is a chart showing um, how uh, least turns or piping plovers have recovered. You can see from the early 80s um, when there were, you know, about 10 nests in the entire state of Maine, um, that as of 2015, there were way up over 60. And this is the latest chart I have, but it is way out of date. I was just talking to Laura Zitsky, our biologist who uh, is in charge of Maine Audubon's portion of this project. She says that there is there are at least 108 plovers attempting to nest right here and is, uh, this year, and as many as 120, so almost double the number that we see in the blue line here. Um, this works, conservation works when we can get together and do it, right? Um, that's sort of a theme of um, all of this, this program and all the endangered species work is that it works when you, when you protect the species and you uh, work together and you get great biologists uh, who you, know, you can have the time and money to put plans together and actually put recovery projects in action, the species recovers, right? It's amazing. And right now piping plovers are recovering so fast that our biologists on the ground are, are panicking because it's so much work to keep up with, to keep up with them all. So that's piping plovers and that's sort of um, a great lead in, I think, to um, how you can help. So, um, oops, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Actually, I should keep sharing my screen. Um, but, um, and turn it over to Melanie really quickly, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Steve and Nick for teaching us about these four really interesting species and sh sharing the success story, especially of the bald eagle. It's pretty remarkable how that species has rebounded in the US thanks to the ESA. So we heard about what we can do at the state level to restore these species, but we also need national and international action to protect fish, wildlife, and plants. To that end, we're excited that Congresswoman Pingree, who you heard from earlier, has joined some of her colleagues in Congress in co-sponsoring House Resolution 69, which calls for the creation of a national biodiversity strategy to protect species. Oh, sorry, and my screen is all haywire. Um, we also need to make sure that the best tools that we have, like the Endangered Species Act, are able to meet the needs of these species, right? So that's why we're calling on Maine's congressional uh, delegation to increase federal funding for the ESA in the fiscal year 22 appropriations bill. And to learn more about that, you can go to our websites. Um, let me get this back up. Um, and Man, the technical piece is just all over the map here. Um, about yeah, 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 this thing. Um, there we. Oh man. Um, all right, that is just screwed up. Um, anyway, no mainautobahn.org/esa. I'm sorry that I'm. No we we could uh, um, get those in the chat. And um, main on by Orange slash ESA and NRCM, uh, we are um, putting petitions together to call on Maine's congressional district to help increase this funding. Because as we see, when we get the funding in place, these species recover, and we can get we can protect biodiversity and protect these beautiful species. And maybe um, Todd, who's helping us, can put those two links in the chat while we get to your questions. Um, a lot of really good ones came in. 
But um, why don't we start with the ones about piping plover since we just covered that. Nick, um, what caused the dip in pl plovers from 2004 to 2008 that chart showed? Good question. Um, I, and I will ask Steve as well if he knows. Um, but, you know, when we're talking with a small number of birds, right, you know, th this is a huge success, but we're still talking about um, 120 pairs. And I see a question from Bethany in the chat about 120 birds or pairs. We're talking about pairs. So <clears throat> you can double that for um, the number. There's also some that maybe don't nest. Um, but um, that's still an incredibly small number. It's still one of the rarest birds in the entire state of Maine. Um, and so uh, if, if uh, an accident were to happen, if there were tides that washed out nests uh, or weather didn't cooperate for any reason, um, um, these birds are still really on the edge. Uh, and so um, um, that could attribute the dip. Steve, I don't know if you remember in particular what happened uh, during those yeah, years. Yeah, no, I think, you, I think Nick, you hit on a few of the factors, certainly weather and tides, but back in that era, I think uh, predation was really big. Um, these guys are taken by foxes, skunks, outdoor cats. Um, so we got a little bit more aggressive with our predator control um, exercises on the beach with uh, USDA APHIS folks and others um, and started doing a lot more um, exclusion, exclusing of nests. So yeah, so that's and, and I what recall. I recall. I recall a couple of years ago, um, there was a, a, a least turn colony near Western Beach in Scarborough that um, a fox, a single solitary fox got into and took a, took like all of the nests. Um, so, um, you know, it's a really uh, thin line between, you know, a, a burgeoning population and, um, and a population that's in decline. So um, that's why we do the work. One more question about clovers. How old do individual birds get? Good question. Um, about 10 years is my understanding is some is some of the older birds um, and um, uh, which is which is a pretty good age for these um, small birds which um, you know lead a risky life. They're migrating long distances and they are exposed to all kinds of danger. Um, so about the that's about an average year I would say. Okay um, let's jump over to eagles. We had a couple questions about those Steve. Um, your pictures were really impressive. How, and some of them showed tagging. How do you do the tagging and who does that? Um, both partners at US Fish and Inland Fisheries and Wildlife have done uh, eagle banding for many years now. You can either trap them <laughs> with bait or the young ones that aren't, that's for the adults, of course, but the young ones that aren't flying, uh, we actually have folks climb into the nest and ban them uh, right there on their nest sites. Cool. And there was also a question whether eagles, bald eagles are native to Maine or if they've arrived here in the past. Nope, absolutely native. Past. Yeah. And we, uh, don't know if they've even reached carrying capacity yet. Uh, there's records from back in the 19th century. Um, you know, some gruesome things where people were feeding eagles to hogs because there are so many of them. So um, we don't want them to repeat that. But <laughs> they're certainly a native species. And I think there's, they're going to just take off from where they are now. And how has the increase in number of bald eagles affected the loon population? Um, with any uh, increase in predators like that, you're going to see impacts to other species. For instance, um, great cormorants are a state listed species that only nest on a few offshore ledges and we're seeing increased predation on great cormorant chicks with bald eagle increases. Um, loons, I'm sure there have been impacts, but uh, loons are pretty hardy. They're, <laughs> they're good fighters. I, I'm sure there has been mortality, uh, but nothing significant that I've been made aware of. I just want to recall quickly the famous um, dead bald eagle that was found uh, a few years ago with a that was impaled through the middle by an adult loon. You know, loons loons bills are not something to mess around with, and they can defend their chicks uh, fiercely. Um. Really, we're getting a lot of questions, but I'm gonna just bounce around to some other species here. Um, lynx, how are they adapting to the lack of snow or 
you know, milder winters. Uh, it's certainly, certainly something we've looked at as a department. Uh, we did a few years ago a vulnerability assessment for climate change for a whole suite of species, all of our species of greatest conservation need and lack of snow depth. Um, of course, they've evolved with snow cover and as that changes, it's going to impact their habitat types. Um, it also impacts their prey base if there's not enough white snow and the hairs turn white anyway, as they do in the winter, um, they're much more vulnerable to predation th themselves. So there's a couple impacts there, but certainly it's a concern, lack of snow depth um, in Northern Maine. Mm -hmm. And are lynx related to bobcats? Uh, as felids, yeah, they, you know, they are. And, um in one of your slides, Steve, I don't know if you will remember, um, someone was asking if there are population numbers for after 2005. Um, for lynx, was that? For lynx, yes. Um, boy, I don't have, we do. We do have population numbers. I don't have them at my fingertips, but I'd be happy to get back to that individual with that information. Yeah, and on that note, um, if our listeners want to learn more about Maine's threatened and endangered species, where would you suggest they go looking for that information? I would start on our department's website. We have a whole link to our endangered species program with individual species uh, information that you can download. Um, and as I mentioned before, also look at our state wildlife action plan because uh, that'll you can dig really deep in on that and see uh, trends for um, over 300 species in the state of Maine, including our threatened and endangered ones. So look on our website, and if you can't find what you're looking for, certainly contact me directly at steve.walker at maine.gov, and I'd be happy to help. And I think the same also goes to the DMR site for, uh, for offshore species and marine species. Um, so lots of information there about uh, sea turtles and whales and uh, salmon, things like that. Well, since you said salmon, we have a question about um, Atlantic salmon. You know, obviously, that wasn't one of the species we covered, but um, are you able to share any information about it, Steve? I understand um, it sounds like it might be listed under, or D it'll be DMR's um, jurisdiction, but... Yes, it's currently not included on the main endangered species list, uh, either through IFNW or Maine Department of Marine Resources. That said, we have been actively participating in management programs with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with uh, uh, fisheries associated nonprofits, um, looking at recovery efforts in every line of work we do, whether it's our stocking program or culvert replacements or dam removals, um, it's on the top of our agenda, but it's not formally listed um, in the state of Maine. Sorry for the background noise. Um, there was a question about uh, whether forever chemicals like PFAS are a problem for uh, imperiled species. I would expect they could be. I haven't looked at uh, research, but it could be a contributing factor to a number of number of species declines. I should say too that we are aware of um, certain pesticides that may impact pollinators, like the rusty patch bumblebee and, and many other bees. Um, one of the bills that Maine Audubon and I believe NRCM is advocating for uh, in front of the legislature would um, help ban the use of neonicotinoid uh, pesticides, which um, have a proven uh, negative effect on bees and other pollinators. So we are um, monitoring and pushing that in the legislature right now. Thanks for mentioning that, Nick. Um, and Steve, you covered bees a little bit. There was a question about um, if you have population number estimates for the rusty patch population? Yeah, rusty patch, we are afraid there might not be any left in the state of Maine. Um, and nationally, boy, I could dig that out again. It's not at my fingertips, but we've over the past few seasons, we've 
through our uh, main bumblebee atlas citizen science program um, and efforts of our biologists we've been tracking i believe 14 species of bumblebees some are stable but by and large a lot of them are declining a lot faster than we would hope to see um, so we do have population estimates for uh, all the native bumblebees in Maine that I'd be happy to share offline if, if that person wants to contact me. Great. I see, a, I see a really interesting question in the chat about turkey vultures and are turkey vultures having any measurable or otherwise appreciable impact on any of these endangered species? That's a good question. You know, turkey vultures are uh, increasing in numbers in Maine. They, uh, you know, a couple decades back were, were fairly rare. I believe the first record of nesting turkey vultures in the state was 83 or so. And since then, you know, now you can't shake a stick along the highway without uh, without seeing turkey vultures overhead. Um, do they impact endangered species? You know, I know I would I don't know. I would say probably not. You know, uh, turkey vultures are. Um, my understanding is that you know part of their expansion is aided by basically sort of a new food source, which is humans hitting uh, things alongside the road. Um, and so it's sort of a new uh, 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 you know as highways and cars have expanded, um, so have so has roadkill and turkey vultures are exploiting the roadkill that we're producing. So I, I, I don't think that um, the turkey vultures themselves are sort of taking anything away from any of these endangered species. And as far as I know, they're not no, known to be sort of, um, you know, taking over nesting sites that are used by anyone else. Um, so I don't think so, uh, but they are certainly a, a new arrival. And guess what? Right behind them is another species of vulture called the black vulture, uh, which will be here anytime now. I would note that I've actually seen bald eagles chase uh, turkey vultures off carcasses. So I, <laughs> they're certainly not affecting bald eagles. <laughs> right. A couple more questions here. Are there any plans to include tribes in the management of wildlife here in Maine? Uh, the grant source that I talked about in the front of the state wildlife action, the state wildlife grants is actually the tribal state wildlife grants. And yes, indeed, we, uh, we would love to uh, partner with tribal governments as much as possible. Uh, they're large landowners. They're certainly tied to the land and the natural history of this state. So. Uh, yes, there's, there's funding sources, and our department is always open to working with partners. Great. And Steve, do you have a sense for how much funding goes to imperiled species restoration, either from the state of Maine or from the federal government? Um, Gonna sound like a broken record. I don't have this figure at my fingertips, but it's a drop in the bucket for what we need. Um, there is currently the Recovering America's Wildlife Act this in the House now, soon to be in the U.S. Senate. Um, Congresswoman Pingree uh, was a key supporter of RAWA, Recovering America's Wildlife Act. If it passes through the Senate, where and we believe uh, Senator Collins is going to champion it. Um, that will open, you know, us to funding levels we have never seen for non-game and endangered species in this state. Um, we have never had a dedicated funding source. It's been um, state wildlife grants through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're very reliant on loon plate dollars and chickadee checkoff dollars, uh, but we are woefully behind in terms of our, our needs for um, management costs and staff. And I just want to say quickly, and I make this point over and over again, but when we do get the funding and do dedicate the time to these species, it works, right? We can recover these species. And I know there's so much, you know, scary news out there in the environment with all kinds of things, but, um, but when you put attention and funding and thought and planning into how to recover a species, they recover. And we don't need to sort of lose these creatures. Um, uh, so, uh, and that goes for the bald eagle, that goes for uh, the, the wild turkey, which was extinct in Maine around the turn of the century, and now you, uh, again, is, is terrorizing all our neighborhoods. Um, so uh, when we work together and, and um, get the planning and the funding that we need, uh, these species will come back. So that's, I'm sorry to keep saying it, but it's important. 
I know we're really close to our um, time wrapping up, but I want to acknowledge a question from our friends in Canada, which is um, wh whether there can be some sort of international coordination on um, corridors for links. Is there any sort of international um, links management going on, Steve? There are a lot of landscapes scale conservation initiatives. One that comes to mind is two countries, one forest, which we're partnering with uh, New Brunswick and Quebec, of course, to look at the probably the last large remaining chunk of forest in eastern North America that extends from upstate New York into uh, Quebec and the Maritimes and down through northern Maine. So um, there is that effort that's not specific to links, but it is looking at long-term habitat connectivity at that larger regional scale. Great. Nick, should we keep going with questions or should we wrap up? I think ending on time is a great idea. Well, with that, thank you so much to everyone for attending and big thanks to Steve for being here with us and providing a lot of really interesting information Feel free to reach out to Maine Audubon or NRCM with any questions or for more information. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, guys. Have a great afternoon and enjoy the long weekend. Bye. You too. Bye, everyone.